I want to go in and take a look at contacts and do a real deep dive into what's going on with motion contacts. So to do this analysis, what I'm going to do is just create a brand new motion study. We're going to start from scratch and kind of go through and look at all the different possible ways you can mess up contacts and give you a better understanding so that you can take it to a much more accurate place. So we're going to start out in this case, we're going to turn on um, motion analysis because that gives us the most control over our ability to analyze things. We're going to create some contact and we're going to define the contact between each of these parts separately. So I'm going to say between this one and this one, these are both acrylic. We'll just start with that as an assumption for the first one. For the second one, we're going to treat these both as greasy rubber. And then for the last pair, we're going to treat these contacts as dry steel. Now notice the table is interacting in every case. It's just those interacting pairs that gets changed in each, each condition. We'll turn on gravity in the negative y. And then let's calculate it. And the first lesson of contacts is you have to figure out why your contacts aren't working. They're just flying right through. And the most likely case in this scenario, especially when they just skip completely, is that the time uh, frames per second calculated is nowhere near enough to calculate this. So you can see that by the time you get from this time frame to this time frame, they're already through. There's nothing to sort of stop them. Now it's just literally, can you catch them on the back side? And because there's a little bit of momentum going, the solver just says, nope, we missed. So let's go in and up this to, let's say, 100 frames per second. Let's see what that does. We'll recalculate. And we still missed. OK, 500 frames per second. Calculate. And now we're seeing a little bit better result. So. First things first, you got to really pay attention to your frame rate and make sure that there's plenty of resolution right when that contact is about to take place. Now let's actually zoom in quite a bit in this area here and take a look. We actually have this point where it hits and we have several time points kind of leading into and, and through that. So I'm feeling pretty good about that. Here's a problem though. Take a look at that middle block, that greasy rubber block. See it bouncing around? Looks like a, a little piece of water uh, bubbling around on the top of a hot skillet, right? In the real world, they don't do that. But in here, it does, and that is an indication of um, some more inaccuracies or some problems with the contact definition. So now that we have sort of the contact uh, frame rate kind of figured out, uh, we may decide that we need to go in and actually increase the contact resolution or the accuracy. And this is usually where people start going. This is the road you go down when you're trying to understand why your contacts aren't accurate. And that can work out really well, but it also can just create problems. Let's say I take the 3D contact resolution up really high, and we'll recalculate and see if that does anything. And it doesn't. Oh, there was a nice little hop in there. Let's just say that we want to take our accuracy up real high. Let's see what that does for us. Now that actually does quite a bit better. Why did the accuracy matter so much? Why did the increasing the contact accuracy makes such a difference. And it really has to do with sample rate and with the uh, restitution coefficient and everything else. But what you really just want to make sure of is, first of all, that you're going to get uh, a good, accurate representation of your analysis um, based on a relative to the selected frames per second that you've, you've picked. So accuracy helps with things where, you know, the restitution coefficient is not calculating very well. Resolution helps 
when you're trying to catch things before they fall through other things, and the frames per second needs to be high enough to make sure you have good resolution in that, that contact, that point of contact. In order to understand these solid body contacts and the, the thing that makes them bouncy a little bit more, let's edit one of these features and we'll turn off the automatic material definition. This automatic material definition does a great job of getting you in the ballpark and getting you numbers you can very quickly use. But these impact elastic properties are what's really going to control how they connect and how they bounce against each other. And this is where you can start to get some really wacky behavior. For example, if you take a baseball and you throw it 100 miles an hour into a jello mold, you're liable to see that baseball go straight through the jello. However, if you take a shot put and you throw it at a battle, battleship, the steel hull of a battleship, it's going to bounce right off of that thing with hardly any damage whatsoever to that battleship. So in order to simulate either one of those as accurately as possible, you would need to understand the stiffness value relevant for that interaction. The problem is the stiffness and the damping and the penetration are all very dependent on not only the material of each side, but the shape and everything else. So there's a couple ways that you can go about trying to ascertain what that stiffness is. Now notice that's pounds per inch, and then we have an exponent, we have a max damping value, and we have a penetration value. Let's go and calculate this for one of these blocks relative to another block, just as a random example, and see what that looks like. So I'm going to create a new assembly. and We're going to put two of these blocks in here. And our goal here is to figure out the stiffness of the interaction between these two components. To do this, we're going to use SOLIDWORKS Simulation Premium to do a nonlinear study on these two parts compressing against each other. So we'll create a new study. Now you can do this in a linear study, but you get more data if you do it in a nonlinear study. For the materials, we'll just go ahead and say that both of these materials are steel. So we've got a thousand pounds being pushed down on basically two steel blocks that are uh, contained from being able to bulge out. And so we're going to just say it's a linear uh, representation with time. We'll run the study and it should go pretty quick. And so for our results, what we end up with is, looks like 51 uh, millionths of an inch of total deflection or max deflection. Now that's being deflected throughout the thickness of both objects all the way through. But in the case of motion, we're assuming they're both rigid. So the max displacement value here, that is going to be the penetration value. Next, what we want to look at is displacement versus time. And so we'll go ahead and define a time history plot at one of these nodes of displacement. And we'll just do resultant displacement across the full time range, and you see that it is a linear result. So anytime you have a fully constrained metal part with a force in the range of about a thousand pounds, you can see that the stiffness value is a thousand pounds divided by 51 millionths. That's the uh, stiffness. The penetration is 51 millionths. The exponent is one. And the damping you can specify as between 0.1 and 1%. All right, so let's do that again, except this time we're going to change it a little bit. We're going to remove these constraints. And so now the steel has the ability to sort of bulge out. This is like a larger block 
a uh, block that's four times bigger than these, but that has kind of something out on the edge. Let's run this and see what this looks like. So now our max displacement is a little bit higher, and our response is still very linear. And so we're expecting to see very similar results regardless of what we do from this point forward. Now let's make some changes to the model, some significant changes to the model. What I'm going to do is we'll create a rounded cube. We don't want to do a sphere, that'd be too easy. Now, are we expecting to see different results now with this new geometry? I think the answer is probably yes. Let's find out. Displacement is higher as we expected, and look, it's actually kind of more localized. So you kind of got to dis determine whether that deflection is actually the one you would look at, or whether it would be more around this rim, because that's kind of being pushed inward. The other thing that we're looking at is the response time. Uh, edit definition. Insufficient data. Let's do this node here. And it still looks very linear. So again, exponent 1, all that kind of good stuff. Let's go back to the model. We're going to do one more edit this time. We're going to shell it. Higher displacement yet. And it still looks very linear. So let's see what a 10,000 pounds looks like. So with 10,000 pounds, not only do we get more deflection as expected, we also start to see some nonlinearity in the response of this system. This is where the exponent is going to start to play in, either because of the nonlinearity of the material, where it goes into a, a, a plastic region, or because of the nonlinearity of the problem, because the stiffness changes as the shape changes. So running a nonlinear analysis is going to help you to understand, but keep in mind the very specific nature of the contact, the direction of the contact, the stiffness of each component, the amount of total force is all going to have an impact on what that value could be, and those values can range wildly. So the main thing to keep in mind is if it's something that you're just trying to understand what it basically is going to do, Utilize those existing materials to get you a reasonable starting point. Those will give you the best success overall. But if the results are not realistic, or if the interaction, the specific interaction at that location is extremely important, taking the time to actually calculate those uh, elastic properties in those contacts is going to make a huge difference. Now along the exact same route as contact stiffness, you also need to take into account bushing stiffness. So the same formula and the same basic approach applies. Find out what the maximum displacement is. In this case, this is through two bushings or two sets of bushings. And then when you go to your motion study, make sure the stiffness definition inside your mates is appropriate. In this case, again, we have stiffness, damping, and a reference force value. That information is going to allow you to understand how much give there is in these bushings. One more additional piece of advice is if there's going to be deflection in the bushing and in the part, those two together should theoretically, that interaction should be combined and put into this interaction, this bushing parameter, the bushing stiffness. So if you see things moving more than they should, stretching apart to a, to a point where they're not concentric uh, to, a, to a degree that's not realistic, go in here and make sure that this is correct. This is appropriate for most components, but if you've got a brass bushing versus a Delrin bushing and that's put into a plastic part or a steel part, you're going to get wildly different uh, stiffness values on that bushing interaction. Just keep in mind that the stiffness values you specify are up to you to make sure that they're correct and they cannot be made generic uh, for all scenarios. So if it's important that you get that information accurate, you've got to collect that data yourself. Uh, this can also be done in the real world. If you have a micrometer and a load cell and you can 
uh, create some data points based on uh, force versus deflection, you can get that data or at least an approximation of that data and use it. But whatever you do, it is up to you and your responsibility to make sure that that stiffness value is accurate and appropriate for your study.